Water in the West, one of the most enduring stories of human settlement anywhere around the world. I'm Anthony Flint, and our guest today on the Land Matters podcast has been a leader in creating a more sustainable use of land and water resources. Jim Hallway, who this summer retired as director of the Babbitt Center for Land and Water Policy after serving in that role since the center's founding in 2017. Jim Hallway has been very much engaged on the subject of water and land use for some 40 years, including being elected to the board of the Central Arizona Water Conservation District, directing the Western Lands and Communities Joint Program with the Sonoran Institute and the Lincoln Institute, and also serving as Professor of Practice in Sustainability and Coordinator at Arizona State University for the Arizona Water Institute and as Assistant Director at the Arizona Department of Water Resources. He has degrees from Cornell University and the University of North Carolina, and was inducted into the College of Fellows of the American Institute of Certified Planners. Jim Hallway, thank you for joining Land Matters and having this conversation before you ride off into the sunset. Thanks, Anthony. It's great to see you again. Well, let's get a little background first. People everywhere, I think, have a general sense for what's going on in the West and the Southwest. Towns in Arizona shutting off water, the big reservoirs like Lake Mead drawing down to historic low levels. The bottom line seems to be the water from the Colorado River distributed to nine states in the U.S. and Mexico through a series of agreements and amendments over the years is no longer enough to meet demand. Well, you're in a perfect position to explain all this and reflect back on it. How did this happen? And then we'll get into what you and the Babbitt Center have been doing about it. Sure. The first factor here is we've been in a drought since uh, the year 2000, and 10 to 30 year cycles of wet and dry are normal for the Southwest, normal for arid regions, semi-arid regions throughout the world. That's why we built the large reservoirs we built. We can store about five years of the entire flow of this river in a series of reservoirs, and the two biggest are Lake Mead and Lake Powell. They're the two largest reservoirs in the country. I'll be talking in acre feet. That's how we talk about water quantity in the West. You think of an acre foot, an acre of land that's a foot deep. If I'm growing alfalfa, it's going to take seven feet a year. If I'm growing cotton, it's going to take four feet a year. Then typically an acre foot is probably enough for two families in Arizona to live on. But the hydrology has been changing. And what we depend on is we depend on a heavy winter snow, mostly in the mountains of Colorado, that then melts rapidly in the spring, swells the rivers, and flows into these dams. Well, last year, we actually had a great snowpack. The Farmer's Almanac, if we want to count on that, or folks who watch climate indicators like ocean temperatures off the Pacific Northwest and off the coast of South America, predict that this may very well be another wet year. Well, maybe the drought that started in 2000 is over, or maybe we're just getting two really good years in the middle of what might stretch into a 30 or longer year drought. There have been 50 year droughts in the last 100 years of record. So that's the uncertainty we have to deal with. One of the factors we've got is the river was allocated in the 1920s in the midst of a very wet period. There are a few folks who realized at the time that this may have been a normally wet period, but it was accepted as the normal. So optimistically, folks thought there are 18 to 20 million acre feet of water they're going to flow in this river every year. We took that, we allocated 15 million acre feet to the seven U.S. basin states. We came back a few years later, which is another interesting story, and we allocated 1.5 million acre feet to two states in Mexico. Then the reservoirs themselves lose about a million and a half acre feet due to evaporation. We're dry climate. If you filled a six foot deep pool, it would be empty at the end of the year from evaporation. And so you add all that together, that's 18 million acre feet. Well, it turns out that for the 100 years of record through the 1900s, the average flow is 15 million acre feet. If we look at longer range tree ring research that can look back a thousand years, the estimates are the long term historic flow of the river may have been closer to 14 million acre feet. Okay, we've allocated between allocations and evaporation 18. We've got an inflow of 14. We've obviously got a problem. The upper basin, we divide the Colorado into the upper basin states, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, Wyoming. 
they're using less than their seven and a half million acre feet. In fact, they probably couldn't hydrologically get that seven and a half million acre feet, but they've used a few million acre feet lower. The lower basin states, California, the biggest user, Arizona, the next, and then Nevada with a small allocation, have typically used all of, or in some cases, because they can take water left, they've used more. The California is sometimes used far more than its allocation. The way we look at it now is we have what's called a structural deficit. In normal years and normal use, we're using 1.5 million acre feet more than is coming in. And so we have seen a continuous decline. The drought we're in has only added that decline. So further looking at the river, we use about three quarters of the water for irrigated agriculture, a figure that's typical throughout arid regions of the world actually is often higher than that. The rest goes to cities and industry. And then we have 30 tribal nations that hold about a quarter of the rights in the basin. And often they, though, don't have the necessary infrastructure to use that river. So, you know, when we ask about, again, how we got here, I'd say it was a combination of optimism, beginning, allocating more water, and then it was just ignoring science for political reasons. If I want to get my water project approved, it's going to be a lot easier if I can convince people there's enough water left for their project too. So we, even once we should have known better, we acted like we didn't know better. And then we are in one of the most rapidly growing areas of the world. There's four to five million acres of irrigated agriculture served by the Colorado River and 43 million people in growing live within regions that are dependent on the river. Those 43 million aren't entirely using the river. These regions all have other supplies, but that's how much lives within the region that uses it. And then we're sitting on what looks to be the worst drought in recorded history. That's really what's taken us to where we're at today. And climate change hasn't helped. Is that right? It sort of raised the stakes, made everything more intense, and there have been some hydrological ramifications of climate change. Is that right? Absolutely. Climate change is a game changer. So the average flow in the last few years, okay, we'll leave out last year, which was wet, the year we're in. But the last few years, the average flows, instead of the 15 million we've been seeing, are actually closer to 12. One of the things that climate change will create is the extremes. Both the high flows and the low flows are increasing. It could well be that if we look to mid-century, the mean, the average flow in the river, instead of being 14 to 15, the predictions are it'll be 12 because of climate change or in the range of 12. We have high uncertainty. Well, if the average flow is 12 and we get into another drought, we're going to look at some even lower flows, 9 or 10 million acre feet in the river. And we will need to continue to have a system that can adapt to this variability and adapt to this uncertainty. So what the changes are doing is they're changing the hydrology. Even if we get the same level of precipitation, the mountains, it may be falling as rain instead of snow. It may melt earlier. There's more dust on the snow, so it's warmer. So there's more evaporation of it, leading to more use in the local landscape, maybe more growth in the forest, less water making it to the reservoir. So we designed a hydrologic system for a physical reality that is changing on us. And the change in the level of heat driving the system, so more evaporation and more demand for agriculture, more demand in the urban areas, that heat is actually a more significant factor than the precipitation. Whereas there is a lot of uncertainty about what the future precipitation changes will be in climate change for the Southwest, it's very clear that it's going to be hotter. And that's going to drive this phenomena. And so, unfortunately, we still have a significant portion, maybe about half of our politicians, who are recklessly ignoring this science. They're arguing about whether climate change is happening, whether it's real or not. Luckily, the water and land managers, they know they have no choice but to prepare for this uncertain future that climate change could bring them. And that's droughts that would cause inadequate supplies for historic uses, floods that exceed the infrastructure we've built to handle flooding, wildfires of much greater intensity and size, urban areas that are getting increasingly hot and leading to crisis situations in the middle of the summer. This is the reality of our future, and we need to adapt and deal with it. Well, now let's get to the innovation and the signature approach you've had at the Babbitt Center, connecting land and water. In some ways, it seems really obvious, the idea that careful planning would go on to make sure that any new development, for example, has enough water. But that hasn't been happening so much? Well, it's a mix. We can talk more about this, but most of the states in the West, and actually many states throughout the country, have these rules that we'll loosely call the show me the water rules. In Arizona, it's the assured water supply rules. They apply in the urban areas, typically not in the rural areas of the state. 
Colorado has rules throughout the state, but each county gets to decide what they will look like. These basically say, we will not let you subdivide land until you prove something. In Arizona, that's a 100-year supply of water. In California, it's a 25-year supply of water. These rules are throughout the West and they vary. But to go back to the basic question of bringing land and water together, how we use the land completely determines our water need. It also impacts the quality and the quantity of the supply we get. And land without water is frankly not usable. It has no economic use value, to put it in a sort of Lincoln land value terms. And so for an entity, the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, looking at land throughout the world, there was this recognition of, gosh, we really need to look at the water as well. And that's what led the Lincoln Institute to establish the Babbitt Center. But historically, these land and water resources have been managed in what we might think as separate silos. And so as our current challenges increase, we really need more holistic management. You know, the land planner and the water managers, they need to know what each other's doing. We can't have land planners approving development that the water utility doesn't have the water for or doesn't know is coming. They need to coordinate their efforts and make sure that the water will be available for those future developments. They also need to share and work from the same data. We'll often have situations where the local water utility and the local land planning entity may have completely different data sources as to what they think is the available supply, what they think their future demand and growth are. So these are all areas where the Babbitt Center was formed to bridge those gaps. And so our focus is very much on capacity building of the folks who make these land and water decisions. And so that's primarily local decisions. The users of land, the decision makers about land are one primarily private individuals. Those decisions may be shaped by government policy, but it's typically a homeowner, a developer, a business owner, a farmer who's making that decision. And so we are trying to build their capacity, give them the knowledge and tools necessary to make better decisions. That's really the focus of our work. We think of it as four legs of the chairs, maybe four pillars uh, to integrated land and water management where we focus. So first, urban and growing communities. Obviously, they need the land planning tools. They need things like when they do a comprehensive plan, do they have a water chapter in it? When the local utility does its water resources plan, does it consider how land use will impact its water resources? So we've done a lot of work in that and other tools dealing with urban and growing communities. Second, as I've mentioned before, and perhaps we'll talk more about this, three quarters to 80% of the water use is agriculture. So you can't get serious about land and water without recognizing that irrigated agriculture has about the same size footprint as cities and communities within the basin, but it uses the majority of the water. So they've got to be at the table. The 30 Native American nations that I mentioned, they have 25% of the water rates. They control about 15% of the land. Typically, they haven't been at the table when we've been having these conversations, and they've got to be at the table. So urban and growing communities, agriculture, tribal communities, these are the three areas where the Babbitt Center has been focused through our first six and a half years. There is a fourth leg here that would be a very appropriate place for Lincoln to work, which is public lands. Over half of the land in the basin is public land, mostly federal, but also state land. How we manage that land has a massive impact on our watersheds. This is where the wildfires are happening that have a massive impact on our quality of life, our safety, but also our water supply. Lincoln has a long history of working with public lands. This is an area that, frankly, we haven't had the resources or capacity to add it to our list, but it's a logical place that the Babbitt Center could expand into in the future. In terms of the work we do, I often split it into research, resources and demonstration projects partnerships and uh, training, education, and dissemination. We're very much driven by what I would think of as user-guided research. What are the most effective tools? What are the best ways to engage communities? We're developing different systems to track indicators, to survey the knowledge and perspectives of practitioners so we can think about how best to reach out to them. We do quite a bit with demonstration projects. The most recent one that perhaps chat about a bit later is exploratory scenario planning around what's the future of agriculture. 
we work a lot with what we consider communities of practice and partners. Uh, we are the managing funder and the fiscal agent for an entity called the Water and Tribes Initiative that's bringing the 30 tribes together to help make sure they, one, have a seat at the table in the major regional decision making, but also they have more tools to manage their own water resources. We've created a network of researchers. We fund dissertation fellowships, as do many units of Lincoln. But in our six years of existence, I think we're up to 25 dissertation fellows we funded, which is a way to build community within the research community. In terms of uh, training and education, we do quite a few workshops. We have created, together with the Sonoran Institute, our partner, a program called Growing Water Smart. Half of the communities in Colorado, their local leaders have now gone through this Growing Water Smart training. We've brought the program into Arizona for three years, and this last year we brought the program into California and Utah. And then in terms of dissemination, one of the projects has been interesting. We put out a Colorado River map a while ago, but we created a story map. Uh, We ourselves have been surprised at the use it's gotten. Between the story map about the river itself and the database behind it, uh, I think we're up over 150,000 hits that it's had of users coming in to use it, which is pretty significant numbers. And like the rest of the Lincoln Institute, we've got one policy focus report out and we're beginning to get started on a couple of others. So the Babbitt Center is small. I think we're up to, let's see, I guess six regular staff positions now. Typically, we have a research fellow. We often will bring in summer interns and sometimes through the semester. So with that size, we really have to focus on how can we be an effective catalyst? How can we help make actions happen elsewhere? So we really focus on partnering with practitioners who will be partners in implementing what we do. And frankly, we don't typically take on a project unless we've got a practitioner interested in the implementation side, and we almost never fully fund the work we do. It's a way of guaranteeing that other funders are also interested. It helps us leverage our funding. So typically, the work we do that's reaching out, we're bringing in $3 from every funder for every dollar of Lincoln Institute funding we're putting in. And, And again, those are things that help us stay focused on what not just we may think is important, but what the larger community is putting value in. You mentioned agriculture a couple of times. Let's turn to that sector for a minute. Former Governor Bruce Babbitt, for whom the Babbitt Center, of course, is named, said this in 2021 on the Land Matters podcast that agriculture, which you pointed out uses the vast majority of Colorado River water, is something we need to confront a bit more squarely. Let's listen, and then we'll come back and get your reaction on the other side. I think we must start by acknowledging reality. Irrigated agriculture, you're using more than 80% of the water, drives you to ask, how are we going to manage that? And with the onset of drought, the fact is that we're probably going to have to think of ways not only to make agriculture more efficient, but to accept the reality that some agricultural water will have to be transferred to urban uses as urban populations go up. And we're going to have to accept the reality that there will be some reduction in irrigated agriculture. Fallowing is one time-honored tradition. You take fields out of irrigation every other year to reduce water use. Some land may have to come out of irrigation. Some crop production may move to other parts of the country where there's more rainfall. These are extremely difficult issues that relate to people on the land and that have real consequences. But again, We haven't really stared it straight in the eye and begun to plan and to join a big region-wide discussion. It's a great quote to have, and certainly Bruce Babbitt is someone who has dedicated his career to the integration of land and water, and hence at his last meeting as a Lincoln Institute board member, he was asked, Bruce, we're going to start a land and water policy center. Can we use your name? And there's a bit of a story there that Katie Lincoln could tell, but uh, luckily Bruce said yes. So it's been an honor to stay in touch with Bruce. You know, he's not involved in our policy choices and our management, but he's always a wise statesman on these issues to hear from. So I agree with what Bruce has said about the future of agriculture and how central it is to the future of the Colorado Basin. And ag faces some very significant challenges, right? They're going to have less water. The water they have is going to be less reliable and it's going to be more expensive. So this is clearly going to be a future with less land and production and major challenges to the sector. I believe, and the work of the Babbitt Center is based on the assumption, the philosophy that 
agriculture will remain a critical portion of the Colorado Basin. Much of the rural West is dependent on the agricultural economy. It's central to the culture of the West, but it is going to have to get by with less water. It is going to have to share in the shortages, and we're going to have to see more partnerships between our urban areas and our rural communities on how we're going to manage this threatened resource, frankly. The focus of the Babbitt Center is to drill in and directly work with agricultural communities ensure they understand the challenges they face and that they're involved in shaping that future. I am a great believer in a statement made by Pat O'Toole, the head of the Family Farm Alliance, that people will support what they help to create. And I think this is a universal truth for all the work we do. But if we're talking about agricultural communities, the decisions that are made are going to be local. A lot of them will be made by farmers. They'll be made by the investment bankers that support the farmers. They'll be made by these larger communities as they shape their future. If we want this to work, if we want it to be sustainable, they need to be involved in shaping that future they're going to be part of. And so this is where we're bringing the tool of scenario planning or specifically exploratory scenario planning to bear. Lincoln has a long history. We've partnered with Lincoln Institute's scenario planning team. We've also partnered with some leading researchers, Arizona State University, to create this program. And we use some funding from the Lincoln's budget to do this. But the idea of exploratory scenario planning is that it's not to pick the future you want. It's not to predict what the future will be. It's to accept and understand that we have a highly uncertain future. Multiple forces may drive it. And instead of trying to predict it, we try to look at a range of futures we may face so that we can anticipate them and be prepared for them. And so we work with communities through several months of preparation planning, a series of meetings to get ready, then a two-day workshop where we bring the community in. So we'll have like 40 members of the community come in and we will sit down with them and we will look at what might your future be? What futures do you want to think more about? And if you find yourself in one of these futures, what kind of strategies would you adopt? We then have some funding and follow-up technical assistance to help the communities take this and use what they did in the workshop to galvanize and catalyze some ongoing work and implementation. We did a workshop in Grand Junction, Colorado in March of 2023, and have produced a video about that that Lincoln funded called Sowing Seed. So if anyone's interested, I'd encourage them to look at that. Actually, my last activity as a Babbitt Center staff was mid-September. We went down to southern Arizona to Cochise County, very different than Grand Junction, Colorado, a groundwater-dependent region. And we just did the workshop there. And in both cases, the community has been motivated and very happy with how the workshop went. And in early 2024, in fact, we will have a video coming out from the work in Southern Arizona as well. Hopefully there'll be a third workshop, a third demonstration project in a very different community. And then what we'd hope to do from that in typical Babbitt Center Lincoln fashion is produce a how-to manual. Okay, we've done this three times. We've modified these methods. We tried it differently each place. Here is something you can do and hopefully go adopt yourself. Hopefully with the scenario planning team at Lincoln, we'll continue to occasionally go out and help do one of these ourselves to continue to develop the technologies. And we've got plans for a policy focus report that would come out in the next year or two that would look specifically at this question of how do we engage agricultural communities in shaping their futures. So that's some of the work we are doing to address what I would agree with Bruce on is the most critical challenge that faces the Colorado River. And I've thought for years, back to my time as the assistant director of the State Water Agency, that Arizona, which is what I knew best, but the other states as well, they really have long needed to sit down with their agricultural communities and say, what is the future of agriculture in our region? What do we want it to be? How can we help it meet the food and fiber needs of the region and the global communities they serve, but also most appropriately use the resources of the region and support the economy? of the region and quality of life. Well, that might be a perfect segue to the use of scenario planning, for example. Are there lessons that you have been learning, that the center's been learning, that are transferable to elsewhere around the world, this being a global problem? And of course, the flip side, can lessons from elsewhere be useful here? Absolutely. And just to stick with the scenario planning example we were on for a minute. So scenario planning has been used quite a bit. Lincoln has been an innovator in bringing this tool to communities throughout the globe. One of the things that we are doing differently here that will be very important lessons is typically scenario planning has been done in urban communities. We see very few examples of rural. And typically the audience you bring together to the workshop is an audience of experts. 
well, we're going to rural communities and we're bringing the community. It's not the experts, it's the farmers, it's the local banker, it's the local elected official, it's the realtor. Those are the folks we are bringing around the table, the leaders of the community. That has led to some real learning about, well, how do you have to change this methodology to work in that kind of community? We're also hoping that as part of our third use that we will look at using scenario planning in a tribal community. So there are very different ways of thinking about the future, and it will be an interesting challenge to see, can we use this technique working with indigenous communities in general that have different ways of looking at information and making decisions about it. That's one example, and clearly this tool that we're trying to perfect would be useful globally. But certainly in general, just sharing lessons, in particular with other arid and semi-arid regions, is going to be central to the mission of the Babbitt Center going forward. And these are, you know, as Lincoln Institute partners understand well, these are typically the fastest growing regions in the world. They're also the ones that in many cases are most threatened by climate change. They're facing similar issues to what we face in the Colorado Basin. Though they may have very different cultures and very different governing institutions, we can figure out how to take their lessons learned and translate them here. They can figure out how to take our lessons and translate them there. The Babbitt Center is six and a half years old now. And as we started, I very much resisted the efforts to dilute our focus on the Colorado River. And my rationale there was we really needed to get well established. We needed to prove our value. We need to make sure we had lessons to share. Well, we are now there. I keep saying we. I guess it isn't really we anymore, is it, Anthony? It's the Babbitt Center that I'm not part of. But they are very well positioned. They've got a great staff. And I think they are ready to engage globally now. Anything come to mind from other areas that are confronting this problem that could be applied in the U.S.? Making irrigation more efficient. I mean, there's got to be a whole world of innovation and investigation on that front, isn't there? Certainly there is. And, uh, you know, one of the centers of real innovation, irrigation efficiency is the Middle East and Israel. And there are lots of communities in the Colorado Basin that are looking at some of the highly efficient and low technology, because that's also important in some cases, irrigation techniques for greater efficiency. So that's clearly one. There are also some truly ancient technologies of managing water that in an era of less resources, we may need to rediscover and put to use, you know, old cultural practices that have been lost that could be brought back. There's clearly a lot of potential there. And then, you know, there's other basins. The Murray-Darling Basin in Australia is certainly really well known as one that faced major challenges and took some very innovative steps. So lots of ability for information exchange there, like I say, as well as just arid regions throughout the world. You've certainly had quite a ride and you've had quite a view on everything that's happened with regard to water and land uh, in the West and around the world. I'm going to make a bit of an assumption here, but let me ask you finally, what sustains your optimism? You know, it's important for anyone doing this kind of work to find some way to sustain themselves, right? I suspect the things that make me most optimistic is when I look at the 20s and 30s, some things, right? It seems that they really have an understanding of the challenges they're inheriting, or should I say the problems that we have created and left behind for them as we exit the field. So their understanding of that and their commitment to find what I would think of as collaborative solutions and hopefully not get hung up on the same divisive issues that their parents have gotten hung up on. And in general, the ability of people to adapt in the face of necessity. Having said that, for a decade or more now, my theme has been that our biggest challenge is our ability to govern ourselves. When societies fail, sure, it may look like it's because of a flood, a drought, disease, warfare, but typically societies have survived those before. Why do they not survive the next one? And typically what we find is they lost the ability to govern themselves. And so to me, that is where my main pessimism comes from. It isn't our water challenge. It's will we come together? Will we make the necessary decisions we need to govern ourselves? That is our biggest challenge. And it's what we're doing particularly badly at the moment. When I'm trying to, you know, make lemonade out of lemons, it's thinking that water has typically been handled in a nonpartisan way. I don't want to say there's a politics in water because there clearly is, but it tends to be a stakeholder politic. This city versus that city, cities versus mines, cities and mines together versus agriculture. Those are much more tractable. 
than our partisan, almost religious type divide. So water perhaps will help us rediscover our ability to come together and make collaborative decisions. There's very few things that humans will see as critical to their survival as a good water supply. Pretty clear, pretty compelling. Let's hope it's part of our path forward. Well, Jim Holloway, thank you again for being on Land Matters and congratulations on your great career and retirement. By the way, what will you be doing? What are your plans, if you don't mind sharing? Sure. Um, well, certainly travel will be part of it. A lot of travel has been put off for a while, and my wife and I are heading off tomorrow for a month in Europe that will mostly be uh, hiking, walking the Camino de Santiago. We've also been spending our last couple summers in Colorado. We've been establishing a heritage apple orchard and trying to figure out how best to use and restore a few acres of land we own along the Animas River in Colorado together with our son and his partner. And hopefully soon, my wife and I will get a house built for ourselves on that property and at least for a little while, probably be sharing our time between Colorado and Phoenix. And certainly, I still have a lot of interest in the issues I've worked on, and I can carry some of those out as we figure out how to do some farming in Colorado. But I think perhaps there'll be some contributions that I'll continue to make to address these challenges we've been talking about today once I sort of settle back into retirement. So you're going to be a farmer, too. Very much part-time hobby farmer, but yes. That's fantastic. Thank you. And with those thoughts, that is a wrap for this episode of Land Matters, the podcast of the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. We hope you'll rate, share, and subscribe to Land Matters so you never miss a show. By the way, if you want more information about the Babbitt Center, go to our website, lincolninst.edu, and navigate to our work, and then you'll see it under Centers. And follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter, The handle is easy to remember. It's at Land Policy. So until next time, I'm your host, Anthony Flint. Thanks for listening.